sure would like to uh, again welcome each of you here. It's my pleasure to introduce Gary Summers. Uh, he was introduced at the uh, last session before lunch. I was not at that session, sad to say. I had, I had something important to do. <laughs> He's going to speak to us about church discipline. You know, we, uh, that's almost a forgotten commandment. Nobody practices that much anymore. So it's important for us to, to, to uh, hear something on that subject. Much is spoken today about uh, balanced brethren. You know, my idea of being balanced is leaning neither to the right nor to the left. And I know Gary is one of those level brethren because the bubble's in the middle. <laughs> Gary, come speak to us. Thank you, I think. <laughs> Well, even though it occurred about uh, two decades ago, many of us still remember the Donahue Show, in which Mary and Gwen's ambulance, uh, ambulance chasing lawyer stared into the camera after talking about how the elders went and spied on her. You may remember that. Uh, and looked into the camera and said concerning our withdrawing of fellowship, to uh, of uh, unfaithful brethren, they won't do it again. Well, some probably have not. But faithful brethren do withdraw fellowship because it is a command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. That lawyer kind of reminds me of the flea floating down a river on a raft coming to a drawbridge saying, raise it up! What arrogance to think that through legal manipulation that followers of the Lord would refuse to practice church discipline because of him. Unfortunately, this uh, pompous hayseed probably did deter some congregations from taking scriptural action, but the word of God did not change because uh, he won a court case temporarily. Uh, that is, the decision was temporary. <laughs> the amount of money was temporary. But uh, the Word of God is permanent. And somebody winning any kind of a court case is not going to change what the Word says that was written nearly two millennia ago. Congregations will always be submitting to the will of him who died for us. Now, we'd like to take a few minutes to look at uh, how God withdrew fellowship in the Old Testament. And usually it was through death. And there are several illustrations of this. When he gave his law to the Israelites, he expected them to be obeyed. The penalty for a rebellion was severe. First, in uh, fewer than six weeks from the time that Moses went up on the mount, the Israelites had convinced Aaron to fashion a golden calf. And God's response to the problem was immediate and severe. He asked who was on the Lord's side, and some of the sons of Levi came to him, and he had them uh, gird on their swords and go throughout uh, the congregation, and some 3,000 were killed who had refused to repent and who adamantly stood disobedient, Exodus 32, 27 and 28. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, we have the uh, case of Nadab and Abihu, who offered profane fire, which God had neither commanded nor in any way authorized them to use. Again, God excluded them from fellowship swiftly, by devouring them with fire. Third, the son of an Israelite woman blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, Leviticus 24.11. Obviously, this action was wrong, but they did not know immediately what to do about it. So 
Uh, they inquired of the Lord, and the re Lord revealed to them that they should lay hands on him, on his head, while the rest of the congregation stoned him with stones. Leviticus 24, 12 through 16. Number four, God had commanded, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, Exodus 20 and verse 8. But as with most commands, it was only a matter of time until someone violated it. One man decided to gather sticks on the Sabbath day, and God told Moses to handle the situation by having the congregation withdraw fellowship from him by stoning him with stones outside the camp, Exodus 15:32 through 36. Death is the ultimate exclusion from fellowship on earth. On the day of judgment, all the wicked shall be permanently and irrevocably excluded from God's fellowship. That will be the ultimate occasion where God separates the good from the evil. One more example we want to look at from the Old Testament, and that would be Achan. Achan disturbed the unity of the nation, and really that's what this is about. Sin disrupts fellowships, uh, fellowship and disturbs unity. Achan disturbed the unity of the nation by clearly violating God's ban upon the spoils of Jericho. No matter what God, uh, language God uses, whether it would be Hebrew or Greek, or no matter what language the Bible is translated into, such as English, people seem to have problems with comprehension. Thou shalt not commit adultery seems plain, but some people scratch their heads and say, I wonder, does that mean we shouldn't commit adultery? Well, why is that hard to understand? It's uh, plain in any language the Bible is translated into. Christianity uh, does not, uh, of course, involve the uh, Sabbath keeping that uh, was in the Old Testament. We do not have that commandment. It's one that is not repeated in any way. We do have a special day, but it's not parallel to the Sabbath day. But, you know, when they heard that commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy, how hard could that be to understand? Do no work. It's spelled out. And yet, somebody's out doing some work. Or, how hard is it to understand you shall not make for yourself any graven image that Aaron went ahead and made a graven image? You know, these are not problems of understanding language. These are not uh, intense, uh, just uh, very difficult to understand theological dissertations. These are about as simple as you can get. And it illustrates the point that it is not God who has a problem in communicating, nor is it man who has a problem really understanding it. The problem is the heart. And man doesn't want to accept what God has revealed. God said that all the silver and gold of the city was to be consecrated unto him. Joshua 6, 19. Which seems fairly clear. But Achan took it anyway. So what are the choices? Why did Achan do what he did? Well, number one, maybe he thought God didn't mean what he said. I think a lot of people look at the Bible and say, well, I know what it says, but I really don't think God meant that. Or maybe number two, he thought God did mean what he said, but the message didn't apply to him. Isn't that the way most people, a lot of people think today? Yeah, I think the Word of God says something about that, but I don't think that applies to me. I'm the exception. Or number three, maybe he said to himself, God did mean what he said. And that prohibition does apply to me, but I think I can do it in such a sneaky way that he won't find out. Well, some people thought that. You know, uh, from Ezekiel chapter 8, there were 70 elders in Israel who said, God doesn't see. 
what goes on in this room. So yes, some people have actually taken that approach. Or perhaps number four, he said God would know uh, to himself that God would know he had violated the law, uh, but he would probably not be uh, that upset over it. He would just let it go. Or number five, well, I know that it is wrong. I know God did say it. I probably will get caught. He probably will punish me, but the punishment probably won't be that, that bad. After all, God is gracious and merciful, and uh, he might slap me on the wrist. Well, whatever he was thinking, <laughs> he was wrong. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways higher uh, than your ways. So, Isaiah 55, 8. Achan did not understand God's thinking. He was looking at the situation from a purely human perspective. From what the Bible teaches as a whole, we have an idea of the way that God looked at a situation. Let me suggest some things that God may have seen when he looked at Achan. Number one, he may, as he looked at Achan, have seen a man rebelling against his law. I said this, he's violating it. He was rebelling against his law. Second, he probably saw a selfish, impatient man who could not wait to get his hands on the spoils that God was going to give them, starting with the next city on. He just was too impatient to wait for. Third, he saw a man with little or no faith. God had taken Israel from slavery to freedom. He had given them daily food, manna, in the wilderness for 40 years. They had recently defeated Sihon and Og and the Moabites. Furthermore, they crossed over just days before the Jordan River on dry ground, which shows the power of God, as does the fact that they conquered the city easily due to God's help. Does God take care of his people? Is he trustworthy? God may be relied upon even if people do not receive immediately what they desire. Nevertheless, God always provides. In a short time, Achan could have partaken of the legitimate and abundant spoils that God was waiting to bless him with, but he did not. Number four, because he was not a man of faith. Number four, he saw a man with no respect for his word. A man with no respect for his word. If Achan had esteemed God, he would have gladly obeyed just like those on Pentecost who gladly received uh, the word that Peter preached. But he did not gladly receive or obey what God said. And most people today share the same mindset. If they like what the Bible teaches, they will abide by what it says. But if it contains a uh, favorite sin, if it condemns a favorite sin, uh, such as uh, losing one's temper, or uh, it enjoins something positive that would require energy, such as asking people to get up out of bed and come to worship on Sunday morning, something difficult like that, then suddenly the individual rates his own authority as higher than God's authority. Trusting in self ahead of God is a foolish and treacherous thing to do. Number five, he saw a man with little or no fear of God. How could you do what Achan did and have any fear of God at all? No person in Israel could have doubted the power of God because of uh, things we've, we've already mentioned. Where then did Achan go awry? Apparently he thought that God, though all-powerful, would not wield his might against him. Did he count too much on God's love and grace? A lot of people are today. In fact, many people are using it for an excuse not to do things that they ought to do or to go ahead and do things that God says you ought not to do. They think somehow they are exceptions 
And some have even been known to say, well, God knows that I struggle with this sin and he knows I can't give it up. He'll just have to accept me the way that I am. I don't think so. God accepts people who obey what he says to do, not people who make excuses. The sin Achan could not give up, obviously, was covetousness. Number six. God saw a man with insufficient love for him and for others. Had Achan loved God, he would have put him first and kept his commandments, a definition of love Jesus gives in the New Testament, John 14, 15. If he had loved his fellow Israelites, he would not have jeopardized them by bringing sin into the camp. John Dunn correctly observed uh, many centuries later, no man is an island, entire of himself. We are influenced by others. What we do influences others. Achan knew that Israel was to be a holy people, and yet he blithely took of the uh, things that were forbidden. He did that anyway, showing thus that he was selfish and not considering the effects on even his own family, who he probably had to make complicit in what he did. If people hold uh, to this kind of attitude, they are going to do anything and everything their hearts desire and instead of what God commands. Number seven, he saw a man who had disrupted the unity of the congregation. And when people go into sin, that is precisely what happens. They throw up a wedge into the church today. When they choose to sin, they disrupt the unity of the congregation. You know, when somebody stands up against sin, everybody seems to want to blame them. They're not the ones that, drove, or that brought the sin in. They're the ones trying to deal with the sin and keep it out. All of the people in Israel were united as they crossed the Jordan River, as they went to the city of Jericho. They were a cohesive unit as they marched around the walls of Jericho 13 times in seven days and then shouted, the enemy was theirs, the conquest was underway. Achan allowed his eyes to get the better of him and to take what God had forbidden. As God observes his nation, he sees a body of believers with, with complete unity and obedience except this one dark spot upon the nation's holiness. Now, Numbers chapter 26 and verse 51 tells us that there were 601 uh, 1,730 warriors as uh, the new generation uh, had come along and they had that many fighting men, over 600,000. Only one was stained with sin. How insignificant is that? One out of 601,000 men. You know, the percentage is, is just about infinitesimal. It's point zero 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 one six. That's the percentage of those who were sinful at that particular time. Or uh, to say it another way, 1.6 million. That's the percentage of people in Israel who were sinful at this time. And, uh, you know, that would probably even satisfy OSHA in most cases. <laughs> But that figure was significant as far as God was concerned. The body was stained. The nation had been defiled. Furthermore, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so God did not tolerate this as tiny and insignificant a percentage as it was. And that ought to tell us something about God's view of sin and what needs to happen in the body of Christ today when sin enters into it. So let's go to the New Testament. 
we live under a covenant in which withdrawing fellowship is still practiced, but not in a physical sense. People are not stoned today as Achan was and as some of the others were. Otherwise, the faculty of ACU would be severely bruised and battered by now, if alive at all. But church discipline is commanded, which means we must practice it, despite the ravings of greedy attorneys and verdicts of unjust courts. We have a responsibility to do what is right, regardless of what else is going on in the world. Jesus, our Lord, first spoke about this practice in Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Although the uh, original offense mentioned there was between two brothers, the matter eventually, if not taken care of at that level, if the person does not repent at that level, eventually winds up being told to the whole church. God expects then something to be done about it if the person still refuses to repent, and the church then is to withdraw fellowship from the impenitent brother. God does not believe in remaining silent about sin. When Adam sinned, he did not say, Hmm. Huh. this man and his wife are all I have created and now they've sinned. Maybe I should just keep silent about it and pretend like nothing has happened. He didn't take that approach, did he? Instead, he asked Adam what might be considered the greatest spiritual question of all time. Where art thou? When David sinned, God did not say, wow, this is a rough one. He's a man after my own heart, and he's been a wonderful king in fighting my battles for me. Uh, it's not as though he's running roughshod over the kingdom. Maybe I should just cut him a little slack. God could not pass over David's impenitence. He sent Nathan to tell him, thou art the man. He dealt with the sin. Are we godlike if we do not call people to account for their sins? Are brethren being scriptural when they give someone like Dave Miller a pass when it has been proven that he is a false teacher? Why are so many fellowshipping him when if they truly loved him, they'd be saying, where art thou? and declaring unto him, Thou art the man responsible for a great deal of division in the body of Christ today. He is a man guilty of false teaching on marriage and on elder reevaluation, reaffirmation. God will not neglect this issue with him. Jesus will not overlook this. If he didn't overlook Adam and he didn't overlook David, I don't think he's going to overlook Dave either. Jesus does not expect the church to practice selective forgetfulness either. Jesus wants problems in the church resolved because we cannot be united as long as they exist and we're going in different directions any more than brethren in Corinth could be. And again, we discussed that earlier, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 13. Not only did Jesus place an obligation upon the offended brother in Matthew 18 to resolve the problem, he also had earlier taught this in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there the gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer your gift. So it works both ways. If somebody's offended you, he may or may not know it. You go to him. If you know that you have offended somebody, you need to go to him and make things right. In other words, one who knows he has offended his brother has a responsibility to try to resolve that conflict. 
and the offended brother must do likewise. The result will result uh, will be unity amongst ourselves if properly followed and if the proper attitudes are in evidence. I once uh, saw this occur in rather an unusual way. Uh, we were not members of the congregation at that time, but uh, my father-in-law was, and we went uh, to visit on that one particular day, and he went forward. And I thought, well, that's odd, because uh, he's about the last person I expected to go forward. And he did something that I have never seen <laughs> done before or since. Apparently, there had been some rumors floating around that some brethren had something against him. So he went forward and he did this. He said, I have heard that some brethren may have something against me, and I want you to tell me what it is right now. And if you don't want to tell me now, you can tell me after worship. Because if I have offended you, I need to know what I've done. Nobody said a word. Nobody talked to him afterward, and the rumor stopped. But if you know that somebody has something against you, you need to go to that person. You need to talk to that person and try to settle it between yourselves. The alternative to taking a course of action in discipline is to disobey God and to say nothing. What are the reasons for withdrawing fellowship from brethren in the New Testament? Well, we all know these pretty well, I think. First of all, we deliver a brother to Satan because it will keep the body of Christ pure. You have somebody who's contaminating the body. And so that needs to be removed. Several examples of this we cited from the Old Testament. Uh, and uh, we can uh, cite them for the New Testament as well, the principle at least. Paul commanded, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Our worship ought to be without sin in the body. That is, if we know, if we have knowledge of something, of course we cannot know what we, we're not apprised of, but we ought to be taking care of things that we do know of that our worship can be in sincerity and in truth. If brethren desire to be counted faithful by the head of the church, sin has got to be dealt with. Second, the purpose of church discipline is to save the brother's uh, soul who's overtaken in a fault. When somebody obeys the gospel, he's what? Translated out of the kingdom of darkness and uh, into the kingdom of light. And uh, so he has left the kingdom of Satan behind, and he's in the kingdom of Christ. When the church withdraws fellowship from someone, the kingdom of light is sending him back. I mean, we're sending him back out of the kingdom of light at that point, back into the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. The purpose is that he will know that he has disobeyed God, that he has disappointed his Savior, that he is in a direct contradiction to what the Bible teaches, and that he is refusing to live a Christian life. We cannot communicate that unless we tell him and then follow through on that by withdrawing fellowship. The goal is that he will realize the enormity of the consequences of his sin, and he will desire to repent. Third reason for withdrawing fellowship is to quench the influence of sin. It is always the case that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Fourth, the church must take action against sin out of love for the erring brother's soul. What greater love can one brother show to another than to draw him back from the error of his way? thus saving his soul from death, as we read in James 5, 19 and 20. Fifth, the church must return the impenitent soul to Satan so that Christians and onlookers alike will fear the Lord. How else will anyone know that God's word is reliable unless we follow it in every respect? And that includes with withdrawing fellowship. 
If Christians do not keep his commands, why should anyone take God seriously? If we do not follow amongst ourselves what God says to do, why should anybody take anything that we present as serious? If we allow sin to dwell in our midst, what motivation would every, anybody have for leaving the world for, quote, sanctified forms of worldliness? When Uzzah touched the ark, God slew him for violating his law. The text said that David was afraid of the Lord that day. 2 Samuel 6, 9. And he was probably not the only one afraid of the Lord that day. God found it necessary to strike Ananias and Sapphira dead for their sin of lying. And after they were buried, the text tells us, great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Acts 5:11. A healthier respect for God and his New Testament doctrine would certainly make for a stronger church today. Sixth, withdrawing fellowship from brethren who sin and refuse to repent must be done because the Lord commands it. Is that reason enough? Even if we didn't have all the others? Because the Lord commands it. How can we say that we love God and then refuse to keep any command of his? Seventh, only by excluding from membership in the Lord's body those who continue in sin can the church have unity. Unity results from members being committed to our head and obeying his commands. No unity is going to exist if some members are living in sin outside of marriage or living together in unlawful marriage, adultery. There can be no homosexual wing of the church. All of these things are sins. They are defined as sins. And we cannot allow those to exist. Or how can we then walk by the same rule minding the same thing, Philippians 3.16. We can't have totally different ideas, contrasting ways of doing things, and say we have the same mind in all of this. Now, let's look at the categories uh, that we withdraw from people for. Uh, first, from the study of 1 Corinthians 5, we know that Jesus cannot stomach immorality. Verse 1, verse 11, every type of immorality is not listed in this passage, but several are, so that we get the idea. If somebody is violating the Word of God and living in, in an immoral way or in an immoral condition, we simply, if we're going to walk in the light, must withdraw fellowship from those who are walking in darkness. First uh, John 1, 5 uh, through 7. Second, Paul includes also, as those who must be withdrawn from, those who teach false doctrine. Why? Because they're causing people to be lost. We can't allow people to teach doctrines which might end up in immorality or might end up in believing something totally contradictory to plain scriptures throughout the New Testament. That cannot be done. Those people probably want their own following. But those people must be excluded from fellowship. Number three, very similar to that, is the man who is a heretic or factious after the first and second admonition reject Titus chapter 3 and verse 10. And then the fourth group includes those who are unfaithful. The writer of Hebrews exhorted brethren not to forsake the assembling of themselves together as the custom of some is. And yet, uh, many people are still behaving in that way. Their attendance is very sporadic. You never know from one Sunday to the next whether they will be there. They're not consistent. Paul also made it clear that brethren were not allowed to walk disorderly, which means that that's not acceptable. Disorderly, what, what if a soldier only showed up to march every other day? Would anybody consider that a faithful soldier 
a dedicated soldier, and yet some think that they're pleasing to God by being there one week, being gone a couple, being back briefly, being gone again. That's walking disorderly. And we have an obligation to withdraw fellowship from those who refuse to repent of it. All Christians made a commitment to Jesus when they put him on in baptism. If we are living for him who died for us, 2 Corinthians 5.15, we will realize that attendance at worship is the least that we can do. Some in this category have no appreciation for the efforts of loving brethren put forth. To escape the withdrawal of fellowship, some do as Mary and Gwen did. They'll notify the elders verbally or maybe write out a note and say, we're not coming anymore. And they think that should end the matter. Where did they get that from the New Testament? Where's the authority for that? That's simply subterfuge. Brethren always make an effort to encourage the wayward member to repent. And if we don't, we need to repent. But we always make an effort for the wayward member to repent. Those walking disorderly with the attitude of I'm taking my marbles and leaving are not correct in their thinking. They vainly imagine that they're going to shut down the reclamation process. And brethren are trying to reclaim them so that they can be saved. But God never authorized such a disciplinary job as, well, I already left. You can't withdraw from me. The congregation is obligated to restore the disorderly uh, member or withdraw from him. That's just simply the options that uh, Jesus gave us, and that's what we've got to do. Now, uh, a couple of words about unity and diversity. For some reason, some brethren seem to, when it comes to withdrawing fellowship from false teachers, suddenly get amnesia and don't seem to remember 1 Corinthians 1.10. This verse of Scripture is not uh, overly complicated. I think a fifth grader should be able to comprehend it. But some just seem to have difficulty with it. And actually, the more education they have, the more difficult it seems for some of them. Some members of the Lord Church think that it, we cannot, or that we can rather, disagree about fundamentals. I don't mean something that's a little bit vague and that brethren have not taken a strong stand on in, in several centuries, but something that is clear. Some, some can't seem to think that we can get along even on those things. Why is that so difficult to see? You may remember a few years ago that an Abilene professor said that we shouldn't divide on church organization. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible have a church organization? Or are we supposed to admit that uh, if man devises some other system than what's in the New Testament, that that's okay? It's not okay. We do have to divide. If somebody departs from the Scriptures and is going to establish uh, a hierarchy that culminates in the Pope, I'm sorry, but we can't have fellowship with that. That's not biblical. And to say or try to say that it is, is just foolish. He also said that uh, worship shouldn't be a point of division. I'm assuming that means that if some people use instrumental music, that's okay. No, it's not okay. Where is the authority for it? We had a good lesson on that previously today. And then uh, he also thought that uh, it didn't matter whether anybody believed in premillennialism or not. Why, we can be united. Some may believe one thing. Some may believe something else about Jesus' return. But we'll be united anyway. Really? How? You're just ignoring the problem. You're not solving the problem. But worse than all of that was he says we shouldn't be divided over whether somebody is baptized for or because of the remission of sins. What? How many debates have our brethren had on that topic? Let's just throw all those out, because that's not worth considering. 
you know, for the last couple hundred years, we probably had several hundred debates over precisely that very thing, whether baptism is for or because of the remission of sins. And he just wants to throw all that out and smile and say, we can get along anyway. doesn't work. You cannot behave in such a way. Perhaps the learned professor could tell us how a Christian can have fellowship with one who is not a Christian. Because if you're not baptized for the remission of sins, you haven't had the blood of Christ cleanse you of your sins and you're not a child of God. How can one that is a Christian fellowship spiritually one who is not a Christian? I don't get that, do you? But apparently he thinks he can do it and it can be done. Universe, uh, uni and diversity is a myth. One cannot believe that people are saved by baptism, meaning as they repent and respond to the gospel in love, and at the same time that people are saved without baptism for the remission of sin. Those are not compatible. Fellowship cannot exist between opposite views on something so fundamentally important as salvation. And how can two people have fellowship when one thinks that uh, we're going to rise and be uh, with the Lord in the air forever and others are expecting him to come back and set up a temple in Jerusalem? How do you call that unity? That's simply silliness. Those who pretend to have unity while believing these things are just fooling themselves. It's time for us to be serious if we have not been about church discipline because that disrupts unity. And we need to please our Lord, not men. We must be not only students of the word, but, but practitioners of the word as well.